Good afternoon, I'm Karen Holmes Ward. Welcome to City Line. Later in the program, a museum exhibit that helps us better understand mental health. But first, medical breakthroughs, new treatments and medical devices for serious illnesses and life-threatening conditions are available only after years of research and testing. But many of those clinical trials have not been representative of the patients who are most likely to need them. A clear example, according to the findings in a recent Food and Drug Administration report, only 1% of people in the trials for Cambridge-based Biogen's Alzheimer's drug Aduhelm identified as black. Yet black people are about twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease as white people. And this scenario is not uncommon. In 2020, there were 53 newly approved drugs and biologics. 32,000 people participated in clinical trials that year. 75% of participants were white. 8% were black or African-American, only 6% were Asian. The lack of inclusiveness can create real problems when it comes to accuracy. A Boston study recently found that pulse oximeters, the clips that doctors put on a patient's finger to measure blood oxygen levels, and temporal thermometers, which measure temperatures on the forehead, are not as accurate when used on patients with doctor, darker skin. Wow, a lot there. Dr. Benjamin Linus, he is the Medical Director of Community Research Network at Boston Medical Center, and Dr. Thea James, Vice President of Mission and Associate Chief Medical Emergency uh, Medicine, also at BMC, are here now to talk about why and what's changing. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Lot, there's a lot there. One headline before we begin. Just before the holidays, Congress passed the DEPICT Act, which establishes a statutory requirement for diversity in clinical trial participants. Dr. Linus, I want to start with you. Describe why you believe that racial disparities exist in clinical trials and is the statutory requirement uh, the best tool to solve this issue? Sure, absolutely. I think that racial disparities still exist in clinical trials largely because it, the way clinical trials get done. Companies uh, have an interest in doing these trials quickly and efficiently, and so they tend to establish networks with the same sort of group of investigators that have a lot of experience. But when they do that, the trials all just sort of come to the same places over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, and I think it's a nice example of structural racism, honestly. I don't think that anyone involved with these trials is looking to exclude people of color. But the reality is that even though everyone is well-intentioned, if people make decisions that are based only on efficiency and don't think about equity, this is the outcome. Um, and although it's unintended, it's real. And that's what we're seeing today. Dr. James, um, explain, if you would, what some of the challenges might be uh, when it comes to recruitment for these clinical trials. Well, I would say that uh, some of the challenges might be trust being able to establish trust with the people we are trying to recruit and um, getting in the communities with those people, seeing them uh, face to face, asking them various different types of questions and literally just asking what it would take for people to uh, be willing uh, to participate in some of these trials. Dr. Linus, how do you encourage more people of color to participate in the trials? Why is it important? Well, so clearly it's important because of some of the information that you provided at the top of the segment. I think if we're doing science that's not inclusive of all people, then we're doing science that's not generalizable. It doesn't apply to all people. And frankly, that's garbage science. We have to do better. Um, and so I think a, a, a mandate could go a long way to force um, pharmaceutical manufacturers to think about this and to mm -hmm. keep equity at the front of their mind, not only expediency. And we're doing a lot of work at BMC now to build an infrastructure for research that's inclusive and diverse so that when people come into our hospital, they have all the same opportunities that people have at every major hospital in the United States. But when they look around, they see a research workforce that's inclusive, that looks like them, that can speak their language. And we hope that that helps to build trust. And in addition, we're out in the community talking about research every day because mm. that's really the root cause. And Dr. James, you kind of addressed this, but let's go back again. Uh, medical research has been underway for decades. And since the 1980s, the FDA has claimed that it's made efforts to encourage clinical trial diversity. But, you know, as we just outlined and we've heard you both say, we're still seeing recurring examples uh, in these disparities. So I think um, one of the things that people often focus on or reflect on when we're talking about this topic is um, Tuskegee, for example. But I think it's less about Tuskegee and more about what a person experiences every single day in a healthcare system. And uh, we know that 
particularly from some of the work that we've done at BMC internally looking inside our own house, you know, people experience um, situations where they don't feel prioritized, they don't feel, um, you know, necessarily respected. And uh, those types of things build up over time. And people also uh, share these experiences with other people. And mm -hmm. so it's not so much about the history, but about what's happening presently. Mm -hmm. Dr. Linus, we know that communities of color um, were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, yet, according to a review of U.S.-based COVID-19 clinical trials and a multinational team of investigators found that underrepresentation of female, black, and Asian participants compared to the expected rates of uh, the virus in uh, white populations, again, a disparity there. Tell us where things stand now with COVID-related research. So I think COVID-related research has come a long way. People have seen those disparities and care about that a lot. And so I think the world of um, scientists interested in COVID science and, and the pandemic are thinking about how to, to change the way that we recruit so that we can be more inclusive. And so that when we're out into the community talking to people about the vaccine, if they look at me and ask, were there people like me in this study? Sometimes it's difficult to say yes and be honest. And, and we have to do better than that. And I think we've started to take steps. I mentioned what we're doing at BMC. I know the National Institute Institutes of Health have started a community roundtable mm -hmm. and are very concerned about um, equity in trials. And so it's a first step, but I think there's a lot of room left to deliver. Dr. James, uh, Boston Medical Center serves a very diverse patient population. Tell us about the Health Equity Accelerator at BMC. Sure, we uh, just um, celebrated our first um, birthday. <laughs> so um, in 2020, when I mean, America was facing was facing this reckoning with um, with racism and particularly structural racism. We actually paused at that point. You know, we didn't set forth um, or come out with a statement. We actually took about a year, just over a year, to look inside our own house. We sort of looked across the entire enterprise, and what we were doing is looking for disparities, and then. Um, with a keen lens on race, we were interrogating the disparities to look for root causes and inequities. And the inequities were the things that emerged. And, you know, from that, we set up work groups, multidisciplinary uh, work groups that were responsible for each of the various different areas to identify those things. And then everyone was held accountable. We had to come up with what we were going to do about each of the things we found over the next couple of years. And we have dashboards. You know, we've uh, engaged with over 15,000 patients, you know, asking their uh, advice and explaining about their experiences. And then um, we also found that, and we had intentionality, which I think is the most important piece about this, is to actually identify these things and have a uh, rapid um, pathway to actually not just um, address them, but not just like fill these gaps, but like eliminate them. Mm -hmm. And I think um, our work in equity and pregnancy was one of the first examples that gave us a pathway and is a guide to actually um, how we actually do this work. So great work going on at Boston Medical Center. Yes, ma'am. Dr. James, Dr. Linus, thank you both for being here today.